There are hundreds of sites across the state that are open where eligible residents can get vaccines, including mass vaccination sites in Danvers, Springfield, Foxborough, and Boston. And two more mass vac sites will be opening next week or before the end of the month. One's next week. Are they both next week? Uh, in Dartmouth and in Natick. Residents can schedule appointments at these sites. At regional sites, we have several terrific regional collaboratives. At pharmacies, retail pharmacies, some of which are standalone and some of which are inside other retail outlets, community health centers, and at some local boards of health. 95% of the Massachusetts population lives within a 45 minute drive of a mass vac site or within a 30 minute drive of a regional site that represented by a high volume provider. We've also made improvements to the booking process by developing new tools on our website and opening a call center to assist residents who can't book appointments online. So far, we've administered here in the Commonwealth with our provider partners over 1.1 million doses. We now rank number nine in the country for first dose vaccinations per capita, and the Commonwealth is ranked number one in the country for total shots administered per capita among the 24 states that have my, more than 5 million people. Thanks to all that progress, effective Thursday, February 18th, individuals 65 and older and individuals with two or more certain medical conditions will be eligible to get vaccinated. We also added asthma to the list of medical conditions that can qualify for this group. Secretary Sutters will share more details on the full list in a moment, but they will be available on our website. Starting Thursday, eligible residents can visit mass.gov slash COVID vaccine to book an appointment. It's important to note here that new appointments will appear on the website starting tomorrow morning around 8 a.m. There's no reason to stay up all night. These two groups that we're now opening up the vaccination process to represent approximately a million people. It's important to remember the federal government only sends states a small amount of vaccine every week. For the last several weeks, the federal government has shipped about 110,000 first doses per week to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Unless we see a massive increase in shipments from the feds, it will take us at least a month for people in these new groups to be able to book their first vaccine appointment. And believe me, we all know this sounds like a long time, but the demand is so much greater than the supply that we're getting at this point in time. We all remain hopeful that those numbers will increase from the federal government as we go forward, but it's important for people to understand that at this point in time, it's about 110,000 new doses a week for first doses, and we now have a group it represents somewhere around a million people that's going to be joining the ranks of those who are eligible. As soon as we get official guidance from the feds that we're getting a bigger supply, we'll be ready and we'll make sure to incorporate that into the delivery community that we've been working with and we'll obviously let everybody know so that they can take advantage of that. But until then, we have to ask everybody to be patient. There's going to be vaccine eventually for everyone, and everyone will get an appointment. It's just going to take a little while. And I know for a lot of people, that's an enormous source of frustration. And while our weekly supply shipped to Massachusetts from the federal government is steady, our administration continues to build capacity to administer shots at more and more locations so that people have more places to go, but in addition to that, we'll be ready if and when the federal supply on a weekly basis goes up. Tomorrow morning, thousands of new appointments at mass vac sites will be posted online for booking for the following week. Over 70,000 appointments will be available at the mass vaccination sites, and other appointments will be posted throughout the week for sites like pharmacies and some of the regional collaboratives. Details for booking these appointments can be found via the new COVID-19 vaccine finder, which allows residents to search for a vaccine location and view appointment availability at many sites before scheduling. After many days of very interesting conversations with our colleagues at CVS, 
starting this week, the number of appointments available at CVS locations will also be visible through this tool as well. And the tool can be accessed via the state's vaccination website at mass.gov slash COVID vaccine. People who are unable to use the website to make an appointment via the internet can continue to call 211 and follow the prompts for vaccine appointments. Again, I know this is the third time I've said it, but over a million people will now be eligible. But if we continue to only get 110,000 first doses of vaccine each week from the feds, it will take a while, at least a month, for everybody to get appointments and get their first vaccination. And as I said earlier, Massachusetts is now a top 10 state for first doses as we continue to ramp up and move forward. This is particularly important for communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 to ensure equity statewide. Over the last few days, the Command Center and the Department of Public Health have started new initiatives to improve and increase access and help communities who are hit hardest by the pandemic. Utilizing the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index as a starting point, the Department of Public Health has identified 20 municipalities that have had the greatest COVID burden and the greatest percentage of non-white residents. These communities are Boston, Brockton, Chelsea, Everett, Fall River, Fitchburg, Framingham, Haverhill, Holyoke, Lawrence, Lemonster, Lowell, Lynn, Malden, Methuen, New Bedford, Randolph, Revere, Springfield, and Worcester. DPH Commissioner Monica Burrell has reached out to all of these communities so that the state can work with them to assist them in increasing vaccine awareness, addressing vaccine hesitancy, and mitigating barriers to vaccine access. And the administration will also work with their local boards of health to streamline access and increase efficiency. Our goal is to build more efficient vaccination sites regionally that can vaccinate people more quickly. Secretary Sutters today began working with local boards of health who've been offering small-scale vaccine clinics to begin transitioning these operations to serve homebound seniors, individuals who participate in Meals on Wheels programs, and others who are unable to travel on their own to any of the vaccine sites that are currently available. Where there's a geographic need, the state will also work with local boards of health to set up additional regional collaboratives, which have proven so far the ones that are in place to be enormously effective. Lieutenant Governor Polito will talk more about that. The 20 hardest hit municipalities that I just mentioned will continue to distribute vaccine at the local level, are prioritized for retail pharmacy programs, and are served by community health centers, which are also prioritized and other health care providers administering vaccine. As we move forward through the vaccination phases, we need to continue to make sure that we have locations that can distribute the doses quickly and efficiently and effectively. What worked for the early targeted populations in phase one is a lot different than what's going to work for the millions of people across the Commonwealth who are eligible in phases two and three. We're enormously grateful for all the healthcare workers and personnel who helped us stand up all these vaccination centers and that work has made Massachusetts a top 10 state for vaccinations. But we all know we have a lot more to do and a significant way to go to get to the point where everybody who wants a vaccination can get it. None of us thinks this program is moving fast enough, but you can't vaccinate people if you don't have the vaccine to make it available. But we do expect and anticipate that we will see an increase going forward from the feds which is why it's important for us to have significant capacity in place to be able to make quick adjustments based on weekly supply. And as I said, beginning tomorrow with an, addition, an additional 1 million people eligible to receive the vaccine and 70,000 new appointments coming online, the amount of new appointments will be limited unless and until we see significant increases from the feds. For people who are seeking to make an appointment, remember to be patient because, as I said, it may take at least a month for everybody who's part of this new group to get an appointment and to get their first vaccination. Visit mass.gov slash COVID-19, excuse me, COVID vaccine 
to use the appointment finder tool and find a vaccination site that's convenient for you. And everyone that wants a vaccine will be able to get one. Everybody who gets an appointment will be able to get a vaccination. And we just need to make sure that we work through the supply we get as quickly, safely, and as effectively as we can so that we can be in a position to continue to meet the targets we've set for ourselves as we work through these phases. And with that, I will turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon and thank you, Governor. Today we are pleased to announce that residents 65 and older and residents with two or more certain medical conditions will be eligible for the COVID vaccine beginning tomorrow, Thursday, February 18th. Since vaccines arrived in the Commonwealth, our administration has been working hard to build a vaccine infrastructure system and necessary resources to help residents in all communities to access appointments, ensuring equity and efficiency. Working with our local officials and local boards of health is an integral part of our process. Our administration has been working closely with our cities and towns throughout this distribution process to make sure we can get vaccines efficiently to as many residents as possible. Local health officials have been on the front lines of this pandemic since day one and helping your residents, our residents, navigate questions and concerns about COVID and providing local support have been part of your daily operations. We are so thankful for your efforts to stand up these vaccination clinics over these past several weeks and serving so many of your residents. And we are so grateful to our local officials for their ongoing efforts to support our communities. You have done a tremendous job and I know how hard you are all working. Again, we are so grateful and thankful for your efforts and for your partnership and your collaboration. Today, moving forward into the next eligibility group in the distribution process, a million new individuals will become eligible for vaccines. The allocation Massachusetts receives each week from the federal government remains constrained, as the governor outlined. As more people become eligible for the vaccine, we must ensure that there are high capacity sites available in locations that have unmet needs geographically and can offer at least 750 appointments per day. This is where our regional collaborations come into play. We want to continue to empower our communities to provide more resources to their residents. And as former local officials, the governor and I know that locals know their communities best. Our administration will continue to support our municipalities in areas such as promoting vaccine acceptance, providing telehealth, uh, tele town halls to distribute appropriate and pertinent information, and develop messaging campaigns in multiple language. We also will work to plan, develop, or coordinate vaccine programs for residents living in public and private low-income and affordable senior housing, and identify and organize vac vaccination of homebound residents who are unable to access any other vaccination program as they become eligible. These efforts will help ensure that we are reaching the most vulnerable residents who might be ho housebound or otherwise unable to visit a mass vac site or a larger site. The COVID-19 vaccination effort is the largest and most complex vac vaccination program in this country's history. And its success depends on all levels of government, federal, state, and local working together to make this a success. We are thankful to all of our partners who have worked hard to vaccinate individuals in the Commonwealth thus far. We've got more work to do together so that we continue to succeed on this mission. I would now like to turn it over to Secretary Sutters. Thank you. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. As you've heard from all of us, we're frustrated about the demand for vaccines and the federal allocation, the supply that we receive. Last evening, for the very first time of Massachusetts receiving 110,000 doses a week, we finally received a very modest increase of our supply by 29,000 first doses. So for next week, 
we will have 139,000 first doses, the first very modest increase in a long time. I'm going to provide an update on COVID-19 vaccine scheduling resources, run through the two plus certain medical conditions and vaccination of residents and staff of low income and affordable public and private housing and give some insight on funding to support vaccination in historically underserved communities. Since the launch of, COVID of the COVID-19 vaccine scheduling resource line on February 5th, there have been 42,000 telephone calls. They've resulted in 9,500 appointments scheduled. On average, there are 4,000 to 9,000 calls per day during the week. Last Friday, we announced the expansion of the call center for weekends. On Saturday and Sunday, February 13th and 14th, the call center averaged about 1,000 calls each of those days. Today, as another million individuals become eligible for a vaccine, I'd like to remind folks that the COVID-19 vaccine scheduling resource line is available for any individual who's eligible who does not have access or the ability to book an appointment through the online booking system. Those who are able to book online or have someone in their lives to help them, please do so online. This service is available for those who need it. And as a reminder, the resource line hours are Monday through Thursdays from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday, Saturday, and Sundays from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we continue to monitor the um, wait time and the length of time people are on the calls, and we will flex staffing as appropriate because we don't want people to wait. With regard to the two plus certain medical conditions and senior housing, in Massachusetts, as many of you are aware, we have taken a different path than many states in deciding our prioritization groups. From the very start, our goal has been to preserve life, maintain our health care infrastructure, and ensure equitable distribution of the vaccine. As we move into this next priority groups, we're holding true to our commitment to protect vulnerable populations. For individuals with two or more certain medical conditions, in concert with the CDC guidelines, the Commonwealth has adopted the list of conditions that cause individuals to be at an increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Massachusetts has also identified moderate to severe asthma as an eligible medical condition because of the disproportionate impact of asthma on communities of color. So the following conditions are eligible for phase two. These are individuals of any age. Asthma, moderate to severe. Cancer chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, or cardiomyopathies, immunocompromised states such as a weakened immune system from solid organ transplants, obesity and severe obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, smoking, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Among the higher risk groups, as among the higher risk groups becoming eligible for vaccine are residents and staff of low income and affordable public and private senior housing. We recognize that older adults in private and public low income and affordable housing are higher risk individuals that live close to one another and often share common areas and spaces. These residents are at higher risk from complications from COVID due to their age and potentially underlying medical conditions. Municipalities and housing agencies may partner with a vaccine provider, such as a local health center, a health, a hospital, pharmacy, or local board of health, to offer an on-site or off-site clinic for these residents. The vaccine provider must, of course, be enrolled in the MCVP program. Housing agencies have already received the information about this opportunity, and many have begun planning and will receive updated guidance today with additional information on the steps to plan for such clinics. Guidance for public and private low income and affordable senior housing has also been posted to the website. And finally, Massachusetts healthcare community is strong because of its healthcare system, which includes our community health centers. They are trusted healthcare providers in their community. They are of their community and they know their community. Yesterday, we announced an additional $1 million 
$1 million investment in the Mass League of Community Health Centers to support community health center efforts to increase vaccine safety awareness in communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The program has three main objectives. One, of course, is to increase vaccine confidence and knowledge among community engagement staff at the health centers. Second is to implement and, the, to implement and disseminate culturally relevant and linguistically diverse patient education materials. And third is to identify and partner with local community-based organizations and others to provide information and tips to engage people in vaccination conversations, with obviously the overall goal of increasing vaccine acceptance. This grant initiative is one important piece of the Mass League of Community Health Centers COVID-19 vaccine community engagement campaign and recognizes that community health centers, community health workers, and other community-facing outreach workers are critical and widely trusted individuals to address COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy among our most risk communities. The work to raise awareness and acceptance is some of the most important boots on the ground work that is crucial to the success of vaccine, particularly while we continue to experience this constrained supply. The work being done today well positions us to increase vaccine uptake in our most at-risk communities. We're grateful to the Mass League of Community Health Centers for their strong partnership and their tireless worker throughout the pandemic. I look forward to their work each and every day. That, Governor, thank you. Questions? Governor, is the state ready for the crush of people that are going to be going to the website and all to go home? Um, well, I think we had, uh, after this story broke earlier today, I think we had 250,000 visits to the state's website, which processed, you know, people got on the site, but you can't actually sign up until tomorrow. So uh, I think the website will, will be in good shape for this. Um, the call center has done a really nice job taking care of folks who are 75 and older. Um, we do want to continue to make that available as we get into some of these other populations for people who can't access um, an appointment through the website. And what do you say to those people who are 75 and over? 50% of them have been vaccinated, but 50% of them haven't. Well, they're obviously still eligible and, and can continue to make appointments. And remember, a lot of the appointments that are going to roll through today, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday are slots that have already been filled by people who fall into that category. So. Um, I think we'll continue to see that number climb. Governor, you're saying it's going to take at least a month for everyone who's eligible in this next group to get an appointment. I heard that correct. I guess the question then becomes, will the next group then have to wait at least a month before they're eligible? We're getting questions every year. You know, teachers, that big group of essential workers. I mean, what kind of timeline or metrics are we looking at before we move on to that group? Well, we're still on point with the phase one, phase two, phase three that we set up. Um, I lose track of time here sometimes. I think it was probably in December, was it? We're still pretty much on track with that. And so I would, what I would say is that we believe we're still on track with the basic schedule that we set up when we started. But are we looking at 50% of this next group needs to be vaccinated before we move on to the next group in phase two? Well, we certainly want to make sure that um, enough of these folks actually uh, get their first dose so that there will be available capacity when we go to the next group. Um, I think it's important for people um, when, they, when they become eligible that there in fact be slots that are available for them. And the other thing we don't know the answer to is where we're going to be on supply. Um, you know, I've now been on a whole series of calls with governors with the, with the new administration and, um, and on every single one of those calls, you know, the two big there are a lot of them, but the two big messages that come from governors are number one, you know, we understand how important it would be for us to have more than one week's worth of ordering capacity. And I've said that to this room a number of times, and I've said it on that call. So have many other governors. One of the things that would really help with respect to our ability to schedule stuff would be if they could give us a three-week commitment. If they can give us a three-week commitment, like an official three-week commitment that we can order against, then we can say to the provider community, this is what we think your appointment opportunities are going to look like for the next three weeks. And then we can let people book two or three weeks in advance, which would provide a lot more certainty to the folks out there who are looking to make appointments. So that, I mean, that message has been delivered over and over again. 
The second message has been most states now have the capacity to do far more vaccines, vaccinations, than we actually have supply. Because we were led to believe that by the time we got to the end of February, there was going to be a big increase in available capacity coming from the feds. And I certainly hope that at some point, you know, what Secretary Sutter's talked about, that little increase from 120 to 139, um, I hope that's the beginning of what will be a really significant run up. Um, 110 to 139, yeah. Governor, any sense of um, why the percentage of 75s went up so quickly last week? Was there a, did the companion program help? And then also, can we just get a little bit more clarification on the companion program? Because I don't know if you saw in Melrose and some other places are starting to use it, but obviously it was for the mass sites to make sure that we could get them into that more efficient system. So um, we have some statistics on the companion program. The big thing I would say about it is the vast majority of the people who actually got a, a dose as a result of being a companion were for the most part over the age of 50, um, which I think is a good thing. And I can just tell you anecdotally that when I was in Springfield on Saturday, um, I saw a lot of people in wheelchairs and other um, physical supports who were there with a younger person, not a lot younger, but younger, who was helping them work their way through. And we have seen a significant increase, not increase, a significant flow of people over the age of 75, uh, pretty much since we started with that population. Governor, can I ask you about um, maybe pushback from towns? I guess Say there again? Are, there are about 68 towns that are no longer going to be able to give out vaccines. Are you going to expect any pushback from them? And how does this streamline the process not sending vaccines to an individual? Well, keep in mind that um, we hope and anticipate that a lot of folks at the local level who aren't part of a collaborative uh, or who don't want to be part of a collaborative um, will continue to help us with hard to reach populations. Okay? We know there are people out there who are just going to have trouble getting to any site. And that's one role we believe communities are best suited to, to solve for. Um, part of our goal here is to I mean, the big lesson we've taken, we started with a very deliberate and very particular, and I would describe as very um, equitably framed process at the beginning of this. But the big message we got from the public was vaccinate, vaccinate. And there's no question the fastest way to do this is with high volume sites. Now, it's worth pointing out that we have four county collaboratives right now that have been operating for several weeks in Berkshire County, Barnstable County, Franklin County, and um, Worcester County. Um, there are three of the four counties that have exceeded the statewide average in the number of people in their communities who've gotten a first dose. Berkshire County is number one. They're over 15% of their community, their county has, been, has received their first dose. Um, Franklin County is number two. No, Barnstable is number two. They're at 14. Uh, Franklin County is number three. They're at 13. So those regional collaboratives, which have now been running for several weeks, the countywide ones, have proven to be pretty effective. And there are several other collaboratives that are smaller. I think we have what? I want to say like 13 or 14 all in. 13? Um, sort of hard to reach areas. There's not a lot of um, of other op options or availability there, um, they work because we can give them a significant amount of supply and they can dish it out uh, in their communities and make that work effectively. But if we're going to do a lot of people quickly, you've got to be doing more than a couple of hundred one site at a, you know, a couple hundred a day across you know, multiple sites. You've got to be doing, well, I think the regulations from DPH are 750. You've got to be doing at least 750 a day. So does this mean a site like Marshfield Marshfield is a regional site. It's regional, so it can't, but does it have to be open to the entire state, or can, can they stick to 10 towns or something? They need to be open to the state, but let's face it, most of the folks who are going to go to a site like that one are going to live in Plymouth County. I mean, I talked to um, some of the folks from, um, from that site over the weekend, and um, they basically serve you know, what I would describe as the, the area around them. Most of these places do. but. I, none of us want to get one more phone call from somebody who says, 
you know, the closest site to me, right, closest site to my mom, all right, is the next town over, which is in a different county. And she couldn't go there. That just doesn't make any sense. Can you explain a little bit that? Just if, if a local municipality opens it up to non-residents, would they, would they potentially? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta make, you gotta deliver on the volume requirements here because, you know, this is about speed. The faster we get through, um, the, the, the higher the number of doses we deliver every day is going to drive how fast we get to the next group. And the one thing that the experience of the past three weeks has demonstrated is, you know, larger enterprises can deliver a heck of a lot more vaccines more quickly, which is really important. Can you explain a little bit that they have two medical conditions? Do they need a referral from the doctor or the honor system? It's an, an, it's an attestation process for the comorbidity. Um, determinations, and you know, I've talked to governors, Secretary Sutter's talked to uh, Health and Human Service secretaries in other states. It is it is based on an honor system, and um, and I can tell you that based on my conversations with other governors, people for the most part, and I've said this many times here, they follow the rules. People do follow the rules, um, and you know, will there be examples or incidents or circumstances where people uh, where people don't maybe? But I think the overwhelming majority of folks try to be honest about this stuff. Is there going to be a way that you will monitor to see if people are, are following the rules? And if they're not, would you make changes? Well, on the attestation piece, um, that would be a tough one. I mean. So there's no way to check? Well, if somebody shows up and, and says one of their, um, I mean, if somebody were to show up at one of these sites and they were to attest that one of their two comorbidities was obesity and they, you know, were built like you, Steve, um, that obviously probably wouldn't, they probably would not be able to do that. But, um, but I think the goal here is to recognize and understand that other states have been in the same spot and everybody's kicked around a million different ideas about how to create structure around this and in the end people basically decided that the honor system was the best way to go. How much of a role did public pressure play in your decision to move forward to this <clears throat> phase? You said the big message you got from people was to vaccinate. So did that play a role? Um, this is actually in the guidance we put out back in December this is about when we said we were going to get to this phase the 65 plus. Um, I mean it could have been one week or the other but it was basically the end of February so we're pretty much consistent with where we thought we were going to be. So it didn't play a role? I wanted to make sure we got a lot of 75 year old, year old plus people through, and, you know, thankfully we have. Governor, we've learned the legislature's new COVID 19 committee is planning an oversight hearing on your vaccine distribution program. Your response to that, defend it. When we talk all the time to the legislature, I talked to the speaker and the Senate president over the weekend. Uh, Mary Lou does calls at least once a week with both the House and the Senate. Um, we provide them with a lot of material and information and obviously we'll look forward to talking to them about this. So the narrative for a while was that Massachusetts trailed the nation <clears throat> in vaccinations and this was going powerfully. And now we're hearing about top 10s and moving up the leaderboard. Number one among those top 25, moving 24 like, states that have more than 5 million people. Yeah. Moving up like Tiger Woods on the leaderboard, right? So what changed? Well, keep in mind that we said at the beginning of this process that we were going to be slow out of the gate because we were focused on some hard to reach populations. I mean, I can get plenty of people from the mental health and developmental disability and homeless community here, and we could line them up from one end of this room to the other, and they would tell you why they were both surprised and relieved and grateful that one state chose to put those folks at the head of the line. That didn't happen hardly anywhere else. And you're talking about hundreds of sites. I know it's thousands. I was just making sure I didn't overplay my hand there. But, um, and we were also one of the few sites um, that made a decision to go vaccinate within our correctional facilities. We were also one of the few sites 
well, a few states, and I think, again, we may have been the only one that put PCAs, personal care attendants, and uh, home health aides at the top of our list. And one of the reasons we did that is because PCAs and home health aides work with, in most cases, either seniors or other people dealing who are not senior, who are dealing with other disability issues, and are in constant contact with them. And we felt it was important to vaccinate them so that they didn't make the people that they were looking to serve um, sick. And, um, and we also put, I mean, the federal program around, um, around long-term care and SNFs was a federal program, but we put a lot of work into making sure that that was done in as thorough and as aggressive a way as it possibly could be. And it took longer. And, but, you know, we got 90% of our residents in SNFs vaccinated, and I think almost 70%, 80% of, of staff, which is literally like 30 points higher than the national average on that one. But that stuff took a long time. So I knew coming out of the gate we were going to be slow, all right? Um, and our goal was to pivot to this regional collaborative high volume process after we got done with those groups and healthcare and you know hospital workers um, and and frankly you know the people in Massachusetts also responded to this Are we doing they signed up they got appointments and they went and they got vaccinated which is good Are we doing enough to address uh, vaccine inequity as a group uh, that's <clears throat> having a news conference in a little bit uh, saying that uh, as of last week, white residents have received 12 times more doses than black residents and 16 times more doses than black uh, residents. Do you, are those numbers accurate and, and is the state doing enough to address their concerns? Well, one of the reasons um, Commissioner Burrell reached out to those 20 communities um, personally is to say that we're going to work with them to figure out um, how we can enhance uh, vaccination efforts in those communities. I mean, generally speaking, um, you know, our numbers relative to the rest of the country in terms of percent of uh, the population that's black, percent of the population that's Asian, percent of the population that's, um, that's uh, Latinx, our numbers are better than the national averages, okay? But the national averages are nowhere near where they should be. That said, there's also a significant number of people, as we've been collecting this data, um, who are listed as unknown. And so one of the things we've asked the Department of Public Health to do is to take the folks who are listed as unknown and figure out for us um, where they live, you know? Because we do know the zip codes of the people, generally speaking, because, you know, you know, tell us where you live. And I want to see what that data looks like so we can draw some conclusions about, um, about both how to improve our process and, and where some of those folks who got listed as unknown actually live so that we can at least estimate if they belong to certain communities or not. Um, but we're going to continue to invest in the local delivery systems that are the trusted delivery systems in those communities. We're also going to develop, hopefully with them, some campaigns that may even involve, you know, door knocking and stuff like that to try to see if we can get folks to come get vaccinated. So, yeah, we have a lot of work to do here. Is we this agree. Still, is this still a, a, an issue of, of, of reluctance upon some of these people to actually take the vaccine, not so much that they can't get an appointment? You know, it's hard to tell. I think the... Um, there were appointments available at the Reggie Lewis Center over the weekend, right? And we worked hard with a lot of our colleagues in, um, in Boston to try and get folks there. And we've even set up, the city of Boston has set up days or times that are particular for, uh, for folks in the community and that are available to sort of trusted voices in those communities to bring people to get vaccinated. Um, but we definitely have, we have work to do there, and we know that. The main reason we, we, uh, we did this with asthma and sort of went away from the CDC guidelines is it really is an environmental and economic justice issue. Um, there's tons of studies that have been done that demonstrate that um, at-risk communities and communities of color have historically had higher rates of asthma, child asthma, adult asthma, um, and a lot of that has to do um, 
with decisions that were made years ago with respect to how people chose to build neighborhoods and communities. And, um, and it's a legitimate issue. And we view it, we view it as much as an equity issue as a, as a medical issue. I really want to make clear to people that this asthma issue needs to be dealt with now. If we get guidance and advice from other folks in the medical community about other stuff, um, we'll certainly take it under advisement. But this asthma issue is a legitimate issue, and it's a legitimate equity issue, and we want it dealt with right out of the gate. Boy, I think so. Um, I mean, keep in mind that, you know, we get a lot of phone calls from people saying, I saw somebody at a CVS or a Wegmans who was getting a vaccine who wasn't over the age of 75. Well, you know, they could be a healthcare worker, they could be um, a PCA, they could be a home health aide, they could be a lot of different things, and they would still qualify. And, um, and I, I think, again, I think people for the most part are anxious to get vaccinated, I also think people, for the most part, um, have since the beginning of this thing in Massachusetts, um, the overwhelming majority of people have, you know, tried to play by the rules, whatever they were. And, um, and if we come across providers who are um, not biting, not following the guidance and the rules that, uh, that we've developed, we'll deal with them. Are you, are you okay with the Cape Cod situation? Do you think Dartmouth satisfies <clears throat> Well, the thing to remember here is that Barnstable does have a collaborative in place. Um, it might feel more like a competition to the people who are in it, but it is a collaborative. And between Cape Cod Hospital and the community health centers and the local board of health in Barnstable, as I said, you know, they are currently sitting at 14.2% of their population vaccinated, which makes them second only to Pittsfield, excuse me, Berkshire, in terms of the number of um, people in their county who've been vaccinated with one dose so far. I mean, they're performing well, and we'll continue to work with them to expand capacity and to make sure they have access. But, um, and they've also gotten, uh, some of this county stuff will be up on our public report. Is that tomorrow? Okay. Yeah. Um, the hard part, first of all, we're looking at it and we're talking to folks in other states. Um, the, the big challenge with that is if somebody is within 10 sites, um, it's very hard to figure out the algorithm around how you would actually structure that on a pre-registration system, especially if you're talking about three or four weeks or maybe more, depending upon the size of the universe that's eligible. Um, what would be really great from my point of view, with respect to the congressional delegation, would be this issue around visibility, right? If I would love to have the congressional delegation urge the Biden administration to give states three or four weeks of solid, committed visibility into what's coming. Because if we could do that, right, we could then say to people, it's not just next week that's available, it's the next three weeks or the next four weeks. And people could go on the site and they could take all of the sites that might be near them. And remember, you know, there's a lot of sites that most people have, have access to at this point. They could figure out if they want to get it first week, second week, third week, or fourth week, um, work it against whatever's on their own schedule and book it. And, and this to me, in some respects, you know, we get it, we get the message we get from the feds is, you're not going to get any less, right? Which is helpful, but it's not. You can order now, three weeks out, four weeks out, and that order will be validated. Because if we could do that, then we could make decisions about where the vaccine is going to go over the next three or four weeks. We could say that to the provider community. People could then put appointments up on that and people could then book on that. So what I would really like to have the delegation do is push the, push the administration to give states a bigger window 
to book appointments because that would many cases would solve for a lot of people the complexity about getting an appointment. You know you're not, you're not going to get any less. Can't you then just maybe book out not all 100% of the appointments, but maybe 50% or 75% of the appointments, so somebody can go on now and say, yeah, I'm gonna go in two weeks, and, and book those now, and as those, as you get closer, then add them? So, there are two issues associated with this. The first is, certainty is way better than maybe, all right? The second is, if you had visibility on how much you were gonna get, you could basically distribute a bunch of it out and tell people, you're not going to get any less than this. And you could put 75% of it out there and say, that's hard and that's solid. You got nothing to worry about. And then you use the other 25% as time goes by to figure out, based on how people choose to schedule appointments, where you need to move it from one place to another. Um, but without the certainty, it's really hard to create the same certainty among the provider community that's actually administering the vaccines and staffing their sites about what's actually going to be there for them. And the last thing we want to do, the last thing we ever want to do here is end up with people booking appointments. I and mean, this happened in a lot of other states where people booked appointments and then they got told either the day before or the day of that their appointments, like thousands of them, weren't going to be there for them because there wasn't any vaccine. So I just one thing we've tried to say from the beginning of this is if you have an appointment, you're going to get a vaccine. And I just want to make sure that we continue to be able to do that going forward. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Well, keep in mind that as we go through this process, particularly when we get into particular targeted groups, like doing staff in congregate care and, you know, folks with mental health issues and developmental disabilities and, and, and homeless folks, you know, we've already vaccinated a lot of people who are under the age of 70. They just, people who work in hospitals, the folks who work in nursing homes. We've vaccinated PCAs and home health care aides. We've, we've already vaccinated a lot of people who are under certain ages. The one thing we have also learned through this process is you've got to be really simple because these are big numbers and, um, and, it's a, and it's something people are really focused on. And so from our point of view, the nice thing about going from some of these targeted groups that we felt we really needed to get to for public health purposes to the age groups is, you know, age is pretty clearly defined. And I think from our point of view, that's a better place to be. When we get into some of the other, um, the employer categories, obviously, you're, again, you're going to get into populations, hopefully at that point, that are mostly below the age of 65 because we will have dealt with through the housing stuff and the long-term care stuff and the assisted living stuff and the existing appointments, a lot of the folks who are over the age of 65 to begin with. And, and then you're going to end up in a situation where um, you are talking about 65 and less, but we've already vaccinated a lot of people who are between the ages of 30 and 40 who work in, you know, group homes and work in nursing homes and work in uh, emergency rooms and hospitals. So um, I, I kind of I like doing this age piece, especially since so much of the COVID data demonstrates that People over the age of 75 are the most at risk of losing their life, and people over the age of 65 are the next most at risk. Thanks. Guys. Thanks. Thank you.